This show is brought to you by Lewis Peters State Farm, agency representing the number one auto and home insurer in the United States for more than 60 years combined experience in the insurance industry. Local agents that understand South Florida's unique market, you have access to them 24-7, walk in, call in, click in through lewispeters.com. You can find them online on social media at SF Agent Peters, or you can call at 305-275-5585. Remember, lewispeters.com. It's football season, and it's time to make your way over to my bookie. They've got deposit matches, free bets, and huge cash prize contests for you to take advantage of all season long. NFL action, check. College ball, check. Plus, they have a mobile-friendly website and top-of-the-line customer service, making their platform a one-stop shop for all betting needs. My bookie offers action on everything from championship futures to NFL in-game live betting making sure you've covered every step of the way. Sign up at MyBookie today, and when you do, use promo code 3YARDS to claim a halfway match on your deposit. If you put in 200, they'll spot you another 100 to play with. That's promo code 3YARDS so you can claim your bonus when you make your deposit. Sign up today to begin your winning season exclusively at MyBookie. This show is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a revolutionary new daily fantasy game whereby you pick two, three, or four players to go over or under their fantasy point projections, and if you're correct, you win. Pick two or more players from the same sport or league, or go cross leagues for your parlay. Use the promo code 5, that's F-I-V-E, 5, and receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. But first, sign up at prizepicks.com to start winning today. Welcome to Three Yards Per Caddy, a podcast covering the Miami Dolphins and the NFL. Now, here's your hosts, Chris, Alf, and Simon. Now we're on, and welcome to another victorious... This is getting a, this is becoming a habit already, right? Hopefully we do that like maybe four more times in a row. But yes, this is another victorious edition of Three Yards for Carry. Simon Clancy is here. I'm Alfredo Arteaga. Chris Kaufman is here. Simon, how did you experience that game? Uh, I don't know if you listened to the the preview, but I said, you know, I don't expect them to win. But if they win, we should be expecting much more from this team going forward. How did you experience that game? What kind um, of idiots predicted them to lose? Yeah, exactly. I right. mean... I think all three of us, because I didn't think they'd win either, I have to say. I mean, it's a big game on the road, you know, um, against a quarterback that we historically don't do very well against in terms of, you know, a mobile quarter. I had people messaging me going, our defense sucks, they're shit. It's like, dude, calm down. We're in the game. They're playing well. They're stopping the run. You know, Murray is difficult to stop. You know, he is. Teams. Teams have a problem with Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson. In terms of the actual running game, we're doing all right. In terms of the pass game, we're doing all right, lads. Just calm down a little bit. They suck. This is an absolute joke. <laughs> Just like, okay, boys, it's fine. So, yeah, it was live on TV over here. And, uh, yeah, great game. Really enjoyed it. Thought we played magnificently. Didn't think we'd win even going into the fourth quarter, I didn't think we were in because I thought we were just struggling to get off the field. I thought, you know, Murray's ability on third and fourth downs just to pick up those cheeky little first downs was going to come back to kick us in the ass. And, you know, you were hoping that a a quarterback in his second game was essentially going to have to drive down the field every every possession and and score, which he pretty much did. So, um, yeah, great win. Yeah. Tua Tungvaloa, 10, Calamari, 0 in the fourth quarter. That was the story of the game. Yeah. So, Chris, how did you experience? How did you experience that? Because I'll I'll naked. I heard. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Covered Uh, in butter. Yeah, manscaped and uh, manscaped and and you know, lubricated. Um, No, I I, so the game. It was just a the whole game was was pleasant. It was like you know you almost forget what it's like to play in these games a lot. And uh, I was talking with somebody about that too. And, and um, you know, somebody, somebody kind of on the inside and it's like, you know, just, boy, I almost forgot what this feels like. <laughs> and it's, it's just because it was that kind of game and the Dolphins were, were in it clearly um, the whole way and, uh, and, you know, leading a, a lot of the time and, and 
they were matching the Cardinals. And yeah, I mean, the defense couldn't really stop Kyler Murray. They had trouble. And, um, and I do think, you know, if, if you want to come away, we come away from this game having beaten Kyler Murray, but did we come away from this game thinking, okay, the defense now has their answer to the mobile quarterback? Mm-hmm. Maybe not. But, um, but at the same time, what did they do? They went all out. They went all out after him. Uh, this is a defense that counted on, you know, making big plays and turnovers and um, making the sort of big play that might knock them off schedule and, and make sure that they can't keep converting the, the third downs. And then right away they did that, you know, scored that touchdown against them. And that was, I mean, that's the difference in the ball game really. Um, and, and they probably got robbed of another one that would have been pretty crucial, you know, because Byron Jones by all means should have had that interception in the end zone against, mm. uh, against the tight end Daniels. Um, you know, I, I understand why the refs called it the way they did. I think yeah, it's you mentioned that on, on Twitter that Ty goes to the receiver. Uh, Jazz yeah. Yeah. It's, it's I, I think it's stupid. a stupid, it's, it's not a new rule, but it's a stupid yeah. one <laughs> because by definition, if both, both players quote unquote, possess the ball, then neither player possesses the ball. That's, that's, that's the literal definition of possession. Um, so I, I don't understand how either guy possessed it before they were out of bounds, because if they were both, if they were both still fighting it and are going out of bounds, I just think it's a stupid ass rule. Um, but anyway, I, Byron Jones, I mean, if you look at it, he was dead to rights the whole way. And that should have been an interception. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and fine on him for not, for not uh finishing it but still like that's kind of you have to look at that within within um the context of the game plan against the cardinals and how aggressive they were being and how they understood you know yeah there were going to be those plays where christian kirk sneaks behind the defense um and and kyler gets it out there are going to be plays where kyler just makes somebody look silly even though you've gone after him Mm -hmm. and and then he's broken into the uh the second level and and making um and getting crucial yardage and even a touchdown um yeah that was going to happen if you're being aggressive against him but also what's supposed to happen is that emmanuel agba forced fumble with shack loss and return for a touchdown yeah. also what's supposed to happen is the you know the byron jones would be interception in the end zone which would have been a really pivotal pivotal play uh if you look at it um in 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 how the game played out and i think what we weren't sure could happen and as simon touched on it already is he got a rookie quarterback in his second start a play caller that's been tied to the hip to ryan fitzpatrick for six for his last six years in the nfl so and they didn't show much chemistry between play caller and, and quarterback last week um you know, are these guys going to be able to go up and down the field every time and basically score a touchdown to match what Kyler Murray is doing? Mm-hmm. No, of course not. You know, you don't think, you don't think that that's going to happen, but it did. <laughs> and that's what's so, that's what's so awesome. Um, so I think that, you know, kudos to the, to the offense. They, they really took advantage of a admittedly um, injury, you know, injury play Cardinals defense. Um, but they did it on the road across country. And, and very importantly, they did it missing five coaches, which I thought was immensely impressive. Yeah. And Brian Flores deserved the game ball. And guess who gave him one as soon as the game ended? I don't know if you've seen the, the video. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. But he deserved one because Brian Flores was running around doing the defensive substitutions in the backfield for the backfield, the defensive backfield for the defensive line. Then hearing the play call, and then confirming the play call. So he was basically doing four jobs on the sideline. Yeah. And I guess that's why we had, I believe it was twice. We had 10 men on the field <laughs> twice. So, and that's a good, it's good to have a coach who's done every job, right? <laughs> right. Cause he was I mean, doing four of them. He could go, he could right. go sub in. If we're missing scouts, he can go and sub in for, for our scouts in the, in the all-star games or something like, you know, was, I thought it was great that our strength and conditioning coach and our, our director of player, uh, the, Caleb Thornhill, both of them yeah. ended up coach coaching on the day. Yeah. Which yep. I thought was, was tremendous and, and clearly speaks to the plan that Flores had that if something was, ha- was going to happen, that there was always a backup for whichever coach went down 
somebody mm-hmm. was going to step up. There was always going to be, and it just so happened that strength and conditioning guy and, uh, and our director of player um, welfare were the two guys that uh, Caleb obviously played the game, so he would understand. Um, stepped up into the breach, and I, you know, I, apart from a couple of downs where we didn't have enough players on the field, I thought they handled it pretty brilliantly. And I, you know, our coaching generally this season has been outstanding, and uh, yeah. so much kudos to Brian Flores. I mean, you know, he really, you know. He, it does feel like we've got a guy who is going to take a team very close to a Super Bowl in the not too distant future, or I, yeah, into a Super Bowl, and yeah, maybe even against that quarterback. <laughs> so, so, you know, because I saw that Mike Florio uh, was with talking with Peter King, and he was like, "Oh, what a delight th- this was," and you know, it's too bad that we're only going to see it four years from now, and. Peter King corrected him by saying, well, they can meet in the Super Bowl. You understand that, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, so that's something that can happen. I thought they had a plan for Kyler Murray, but, you know, usually against great players, sometimes those plans just don't, you know, they don't bear fruit. But, Everybody's got a plan to, like, you get punched in the face, mate. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mike, The great Mike Tyson said that. Mike Tyson, yeah. And he's, and he's absolutely right. And I thought they had a good plan. They were going to show a lot of zero blitz. They were going to bring three. They were going to bring four. They were going to bring them all. They were going to bring safeties. They were going to bring guys in the A gap, the B gap. It was it was a, a pretty well thought out plan. It was it just got defeated. It's as simple. It as got that. defeated with that Christian Kirk pass. <laughs> yes. Yeah. From from I, I that think... point from that point on, you saw like you saw double safeties back there a lot. Yes. And you saw, I mean, you saw, you saw, you didn't see as much of that zero look anymore. No, no. And- Two things really stood out. Three things really stood out for me, I think. The first is that our running game isn't very good. And no. the Cardinals no. know that. Uh, and teams down the line will know that. And so they packed the box, um, you know, and essentially, essentially forced Tua to, to, um, to beat and they packed the box with blitzers and it essentially forced Tua to beat them through the air because they knew what was coming. We can't run on many people, especially mm-hmm. with Gaskin out. You know, Jordan Howard was fine. And actually, you know, Jordan Howard's best run of the season was that first down run on the final drive where he picked up eight yards on first down, which led to Tua's sneak. Mm-hmm. Yep. The second thing was, the, was I thought the play calling was great. It was just trusted to, uh, to do what we hoped that he would do this time last week when we were talking about, you know, it'd be great for him now next week against the Cardinals to be able to go through progressions, multiple reads um, and do that, which he did a lot more of. And I thought he did really well. Um, and the third thing is when you know what's coming and you still can't stop it, <laughs> i.e. the kid was so accurate. You know, we know, you know, look, we've been talking about him for three years. We know how accurate he is, but it's one thing doing it against Mississippi State. It's one thing doing it against Vanderbilt. It's one thing doing it, you know, even against LSU in the, S- in the SEC. It's another going against Patrick Peterson and Buda Baker. You know, there are a couple of throws. The first throw, so I think it was play three, it was third down on the final drive, which was the final play of the third quarter, where it looked like, there was only one place he could put it. Otherwise, Patrick Peterson's returning it for a pick six. And it was a throw to Devontae Parker. Mm-hmm. And Peterson knew it was coming. Right. And he jumped the route and he still didn't get there because mm-hmm. it was thrown in the perfect spot. Um, and look, a national, at the perfect national, time. At the perfect time. The national audience has done a lot of eulogizing about Tua. We know how good he was. You know, we, we're not going to sit here and go, look at us, look at us, because it's only been two games. But it's clearly, if there was an audition, the audition is now over. You know, the role has been filled. You know, we know who the lead actor is and he is, uh, you know, along with his head coach is potentially heading for an Oscar because he is, um, he is everything we hoped he'd be and, and a lot more. I was just so, I was blown away by how good he was at the weekend. I think we need help, you know, and the running game, the offensive line was an issue, obviously with players moving in and out, you know, Austin Jackson probably yeah. rushed back a little bit too fast. Chris made the great point on Saturday night, on Sunday night. Robert Hunt a couple of times just bending from the waist and really leaning headfirst into certainly to Marcus Golden and getting beaten. Things need work, but by God, there's a lot to be excited about. Yeah, it's always a good thing when you need work and you still get the W, you know. Yeah. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I experienced this. I had a very strange feeling come over me when the score was 31 to 24, and we needed an answer. And I really felt, I haven't remember the last time I felt this way, but it was likely toward the end of Dan Marino's career and not those last two years, a little bit before that, maybe 1997, 1996. And I felt like, you know what? This kid probably has this in him. This is about 
getting off the field after we tie this game on this drive. And it was a 93 yard drive, Simon. <laughs> okay. Mm. They you know tied it on a 93 yard drive. I am not lying when I tell you I had every confidence in the world that he wasn't going to crumble and that this game was going to get away from us at 31 24. I just felt the defense needed to make a play to win it. And they yeah. did make a play, which was yeah. likely on a I, bad I, call by Cliff Kingsbury on that fourth. I've and never one. ever. I've never, ever thought, and I never, ever did think coming into the league that the game was ever going to be too big for him. The Mm -hmm. moment was ever going to be too much for him because Mm -hmm. of the way that he's been brought up and the way that he has always tackled these, you know, you don't come in as the starting quarterback at Alabama. You don't come in in the, in the, you know, to replace the guy that almost won the national championship the year before, almost won the Heisman the year before and knock him out and, and, and go and win a national championship when you're down by 10 points in the fourth quarter. You don't do that if you haven't got balls of steel. That moment against Georgia was never too big for him. It was never too big for him at any point when he started. You know, even even against Clemson, when they lost to Trevor Lawrence in that national championship game, it still wasn't too big for him. He had a couple of bad throws, but he still played. You know, you go back and look at that game in its entirety. Yes. He makes some hellacious throws in that game. Um, so I never thought it was ever going to be too much for him. And it was just the power and the will that he has clearly. And I, what I thought was great was that as soon as the final gun went, as it were, as soon as he took the final, knee, Patrick Peterson went straight over to him and had a, you know, five, eight second chat with him, you know, and Peterson ran over to him, you know, gave him a hug, tapped on the helmet, was clearly talking to him. There was a lot of respect there. Peterson's, you know, he's going to the hall of fame, um, you know, and he would have stepped off that field thinking that kid's got some serious talent. Yeah, absolutely. The moment, even though you didn't expect him to be overwhelmed, it's, it's different. So we knew that he was, he's, he's unusually, we've said it a couple of times, you know, he's unusually pro ready for a rookie, like even as far as rookies go, like, you know, and, and nowadays we have rookie quarterback just playing. Right. And it's, um, and they, they, they play and in, in some um, quite often they play kind of well. Um, but even as far as those, those rookies go, like he is, is unusually pro ready and we knew that the moment was going to be too big but it's one thing to say that it's another thing to say oh there he goes making a guy miss you know who has him dead dead to rights on a free blitz and then making buddha baker look silly <laughs> you buddha know baker hit air. buddha oh. baker's the highest paid say he's the highest paid safety in the in the nfl and um, and in it because he this year you know? Yeah, and, and he's and it, it ain't because he usually you know he's not a guy that picks off a lot of balls either. So like he made Buddha Baker look silly where Buddha Baker excels, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. you know, uh, which is which is coming up on coming up down on the on those ta- uh, tackles. I mean that was like you remember the old Miss play, right? Mm. Um, the old Miss play where he makes somebody miss like that and then and then throws that throws the ball to, like to like he yeah. that head fake. Yeah, that head fake and um and then uh and then you know making Buddha Baker miss after he had already just I mean there was a free rusher who had him dead to rights like and he just made the guy just completely whiff on him and that was uh you know that was obviously uh, a a protection issue that needs to get worked out but still it's one thing to say okay this moment's not going to be too big for him it's another thing to be like holy shit we got a guy that can do that. <laughs> you know yes. that's that's pretty special and the decision making the decision making was just just perfect on the on the fade route to matt college sure. because you saw it it was it was like a pre-snap rpo and he quickly when you see him yeah at the it, was, line, it was definitely a pre-snap rpo he looks at the line and i you know i needed to you know when i'm watching the game you know i'm trying to pick up on some of those things and i looked at that plan i'm like okay they're running it but then i didn't pay attention to what was happening he counts the guys in the box and he immediately said, thinks to himself, yeah. I'm throwing the fade here because <laughs> these guys are putting eight guys yeah. in the box. Buddha Baker's coming into the box and the safety can't get to, to where I'm throwing this fade from the middle of the field. It's just not going to happen. So I'm throwing it. The, I'm and also it. the corners, the corners are showing like really tight press man, man coverage. So exactly. And you have six, four, 220 pounds. So yeah, yeah, it's just the decision making, the balls yeah. to do it, and then just the execution. He did that earlier in the game. He did that earlier in the game. You noticed to it was it was a Preston Williams back shoulder, mm-hmm. um, and that was that was also a pre snap RPO box, you know, box count, 
And, um, and I think, I thought if you really look at it, I think they were, I haven't counted them up yet or anything yet, but um, I did in the last game and I was kind of disappointed to see like only maybe, maybe four RPOs in the, um, the whole game last time. Um, and I thought that maybe that, that was because they were leading the whole time against the Rams and they just, you know, didn't want to put it on tape. But this was a team, the Arizona Cardinals, that uh, their defense, according to uh, ESPN's you know fantasy department, their defense is, is like one of the worst, if not the worst, in the league against play action. Mm-hmm. So uh, it seemed like our you know RPO was what you want to dial up here, and I haven't counted it, but I think they did it quite a bit, and um, and I think that it worked. You know, it worked. It certainly worked on that Matt Collins touchdown. It worked on that um, that Preston Williams uh, back back shoulder throw. Um, there were definitely some other some other RPOs in there, um, and I think that uh, we're just going to see a lot more of that. And, and some of the stuff that actually didn't work, you know, the RPOs that didn't work are, are the ones that you kind of get excited about because they're working on that. You can see that they're working on that. Uh, there's one to Malcolm Perry that they're they're clearly still working on. And when that when that shit starts happening, you know that's, I mean this 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 offense is going to go. And that design um, so pass to Durham, Durham Smythe, uh, you know where I first oh, yeah. saw something like that, right? Adam Gase, like four years ago with Kenyon Drake, he used to run those design passes all the time, and I guess Chan Gailey had it up his sleeve. That was just perfectly executed from Savan Ahmed putting his it, hands up to Eric Flowers faking like he was going to run out to get in front of the screen to Durham Smythe faking like he was going to block and then releasing on a linebacker. It was just well executed completely. It's honestly not that, that rare of a play. Um, if you, if you watch, watch across the league, like offensive coordinators are running these, you know, those sorts of plays quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, using that misdirection. I just think it's different when Tua is the quarterback and he's using his feet to fake out the defenders so well. Yes. And that's what and I pointed out on field. Twitter. Because and opening up the field. Yeah, because that's what he that's what he does. That's what he's been known for since he was uh, since he was at Alabama is he doesn't just he doesn't just manipulate the defense with his eyes, which a lot of quarterbacks do. He manipulates the defense with his feet because his feet are that fast. And, um, and I think that that's, uh, you know, that was a perfect example of it. You just look at, look at the back view of that, um, of that play and you see it. Yeah. Now, you know, your team is, you have a good football team when you could bitch about things that happen during the game and you end up winning anyway. So I got something to bitch about Simon Austin Jackson comes back and you could, yeah, you could say, all right, he came back too soon, but obviously you're going to have to shuffle things around. Jesse Davis to right guard and Solomon Kinley right to the bench after 15 snaps. I mm-hmm. say, I gotta say, I disagree. What you, what mm-hmm. would you have done and what do you think they're going to do going forward? Um, I'm not entirely sure because I haven't seen anything really written about why Kinley was benched in inverted commas. Um, it's not like they were facing a big interior or, or even quick interior defensive lineman. I wonder whether it was to do with blitzing. And the the fact mm-hmm. that Jesse Davis, you know, they were they were sending blitzes, A and B gap blitzes, and I wonder whether or not just Jesse Davis's experience was the thing that, you know, in terms of just seeing things, having played more, um, knowing that perhaps you know Marcus Golden off the edge, but in terms of everything else, you you're sending linebacker blitzes, Buda Baker's coming on blitzes, and and maybe just Davis's experience and identification helping Hunt. That's the only reason I can think that, that that they would do that. Obviously, Kindley was eight, it would be eight games into his career. You know, he's playing a new position in terms of the right side as as opposed to the left side. Beyond that, I can't because I, I don't think he went on the injury report, did he, Chris? I can't remember seeing him on the injury report. It was just that Barry Jackson said they were clearly intending to to sort of make the best of six linemen through the game and sort of mix and match. But it did feel very quickly like Davis started left tackle, then Jackson came in and and Davis went to to right guard and, and hunt played out at right tackle so i'm not really sure just i'm just as confused as you are um i don't have any answers there either because it actually seemed like because i was looking at the the lines that kinley was on and they were having success mm. you know on, on those lines and um and so i'm i'm confused as well uh, i do know that you, you brought up the point and um and you know i kind of echoed it on twitter a uh, day or two ago 
which is Vance Joseph. You know, we know him. He, we know he likes to bring those sort of those double, double barreled a gap blitz looks um, to the, to the defensive front. And really, you know, even though they're backing out of them a lot, it it creates, uh, it creates decisions for the interior alignment. It's possible that they just trusted Jesse Davis a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, For that. But at the same time, let's look at the facts you know, Jesse Davis moved from left tackle over to right guard. And while Austin Jackson took a few of his lumps during the game, it was actually Jesse Davis at right guard that kind of went, went shitty. (laughs) Um, And and I don't think like he was, he had been, he had been in groove at left tackle and I don't think he was playing particularly well at right guard um, when they, when, when they inserted him. So, you know, I don't know. I, I don't, necessarily agree with the move except for who are we to who are we to criticize when we know that brian flores does this i mean we criticize you know nick needham's playing too much too soon and then and then nick needham's playing really well at the you know in the second half of the year or you know any number of the young players right Mm -hmm. that he tosses in there knows they're going to take their lumps and there's a plan though there's a reason uh, you know he wants to reap the benefits later and and this could be that situation and we came away with the win so i guess yeah it could have been it could have been exactly what you said uh, all those you know you keep showing a gap blitzes and solomon kinley sells out to block one of those a gap blitzes and they pull out you leave a lot of space for golden to work on robert hunt and that's a problem so Maybe he had something to do with that, but I'm very, very interested to see what they're going to roll out against the Chargers this week because mm. I'm completely confused with how they played musical offensive linemen in this game. Especially if Joey Bowser is healthy off the concussion because then you've got Malcolm Ingram, on, uh, Melvin Ingram on one, one side and, and Joey Bowser uh, on the other, and that's, a, that, that's an awful lot. for. I mean, that's a real wake-up for Austin uh, Jackson. That's a high. test. Yes. That is a test. A huge test. And... Now, and there's nothing and something to be said also for some good old fashioned competition. Maybe they believe in that, you know, maybe yeah, they have sure. six linemen and they're like, and they're like, you know, whoever practices the best this week gets to play. And, and maybe that puts a fire under several of their asses. And it would have been harsh. Let's be honest, as much as we've criticized him, it would have been harsh for Jesse Davis to go back to the bench, having played the way he's played oh, during yeah. the win streak. Yeah. Mm. Left tackle. Yeah. Now, mm. Early on in this game, Tua Tonga Valoa seemed to have great chemistry with Preston Williams, and it was good to see him playing so well. And he played so well in the first half, considering he had come. He was coming off probably his worst game as a pro last week against the Rams. But then Preston Williams goes out, and Tua Tonga Valoa mm-hmm. switches to Devontae Parker. What are they going to have to do? Because we don't know what's going to happen with Preston Williams yet, do we? Like, we don't have any information as far as his injury. Or foot sprain, foot sprain. So that whatever sounds that, like a whatever weeks. whatever that means. Oh, that could be <laughs> a week, or that could be four or five weeks if it's really really bad. So like that tells he's us absolutely got, nothing. Uh, he's essentially got. Uh, I was picked up by Christian Wilkins and dropped on my ankle in quite a bad way. <laughs> to be fair, they're saying that he actually inj- and I could see how he actually injured it on the touchdown, and it's just like it. You, you didn't really see him limping until the celebration, but I, I saw it. You could see his foot get wrenched on that touchdown, actually, as he crossed the goal line and was tackled. Um, yeah. So maybe I hope, I hope Christian Wilkins didn't do it. So is that, that'd be pretty terrible. Yeah. Well, they, you know, I, who knows? Maybe they're going to, maybe they're covering up for Christian Wilkins, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe, you know, so, you know, what, where are the reinforcements coming from? Like, how do you play this going forward, Simon? Is it just as simple as, hey, Antonio Callaway is coming. Just plug him in. Um, well, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting that, that Kirk Merritt was brought up ahead of, uh, ahead of Callaway. Um, you know, whether they're trying to send a message to Callaway, whether or not that Merritt has been outperforming him. Um, Merritt's obviously been in the system longer. And Callaway, I saw this week, was one of the protected four players on the on the list i think matt collins has to step up a little bit and you know he, he performed well in the moment with which he was called upon at the weekend i think shakeen grant has to step up and you hope that tour and he um continue some some chemistry it'll be interesting to see what happens if durham Smythe is out with the concussion um you kind of want you, you want Tua mm. to start feeding 
Um, you know, Tua's really always thrown to, you know, even with Miller Forrest all at Alabama, he's really, you know, and look, there's a reason when you've got Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddle, Jerry Judy, every great Alabama receiver you can ever think of um, to throw to, you're not going to throw to Miller Forrestal, but I'd like to see him build a bit of a rapport with, um, with Gasicki. It was a great throw that he threw where he rolled out to the left-hand side and just fitted it in between two defenders and hit the slide of Gasicki in the first half. Um, I think you have to rely on Mike a bit more because if Preston is out for any length of time, you know, you're taking a big body away. Um, but guys have got to step up, and that's the mentality that Coach Flores has, has instilled since day one. It's next man up. I know it's a cliche, but that's the way it's worked. Uh, you know, we we've look at look at uh, look at Ahmed at the weekend. Look at you know guys that have stepped up into the breach when called upon. They've done it. They've performed. The the, the cornerbacks that we had last year, we were getting kids off the street who ended up starting. You know, mm-hmm. Ryan Smith was was picked up off the street. You know. Four days later, he's starting against the Indianapolis Colts and playing really well. So, you know, that's just the way it's it's got to be. Somebody else is going to have to step up. Yeah, and of course, uh, as far as the running backs, Savan Ahmed, he looked, you know, well, he looked good. He's he's he pretty much has the best line for a running back for a Dolphin running back this year, except for Gaskin's line against the the Jets, I guess. But other than that, you know, he, he was over five yards per carry. He had that great run. The interesting and, thing about Ahmed is that he was selected by Bobby Turner, the the amazing running backs coach who was with Mike Shanahan for many years with the Denver Broncos and the Washington Redskins and, that, and is now at the 49ers. And you go back and look at Bobby Turner's resume in terms of kids that he w- was involved in. You go back to Robert Smith, you go back to Mike Allstott when he was at Purdue, when he was at um, Ohio State. And then with the Broncos, you know, you had that run of Terrell Davis, Orlandis Gary, Mike Anderson, um, no Sean Moreno. And then with the 49ers, I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, last season in itself, they had four or five backs that essentially powered them to the Super Bowl, including Raheem Mostert, Matt Breeder, obviously, who you've got now, Tevin Coleman, uh, Jeff Thomas. Um, and then Turner's found Jermichael Hasty as well, playing really well for the 49ers. So he was clearly selected for a reason because they thought he was going to fit into that into that system. Mm. Uh, he ran slowly at the combine because he was, he was one of the fastest guys at the university of Washington at there. I think he ran a four thirty one at their junior pro day the year before the draft, the year before he came out. So he's clearly got wheels. He was obviously Gaskin's backup and he's a bit undersized, but I liked what I saw of him and, and they trusted him in big moments. He was on the field in a couple of critical third down moments. Um, so yeah, again, it's next man up mentality. If you're ready, you're ready. And, and Flores isn't going to be afraid to chuck these kids in. Yeah, he was on that oh. third and nine where where Tua yeah. where Tua completed that pass to Devontae Parker to kick off that ninety three yard drive. So mm-hmm. yeah, obviously they, they you know they didn't you know they, they they trusted him to be in pretty big moments. So yeah, I don't know that I would trust Jordan Howard as much though. Continue you know continuing on because aside from that one, you will one when he has twenty eight touchdowns uh, this year, Chris. <laughs> well, right, I guess that's the. Uh, <laughs> That's he's, he's one yard. He's one yard per carry. He's one touchdown per carry. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, is, is where he's heading, but, uh, he's no, I, I, I think Deandre Washington is going to be interesting to see. Yes. Um, I think that's going to happen probably as early as this week. Um, I think that, you know, I think the Savan Ahmed and, um, and Patrick Laird kind of both made a couple of mistakes in the game. Um, and you know that's that's sort of that's that's the sort of thing that can cost them so you know savannah ahmed had good moments too but um but i think he you know for it, it was a first game so it'd probably be forgiven a little bit but um but there's definitely a mistake or two in there um and so we'll we'll see if if it is you know what does the practice week look like now what how is deandre washington practicing how is he you know how is he looking yeah how's patrick laird be- looking oh. um is Matt, yeah, is Matt Breda going to be back? Um, I, I for one would like to see Breda get a nice, a nice run at things if, um, if he is healthy and, and he is playing. So, because I think that he has a load of pot- potential, uh, when healthy. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, as for receiver, Preston Williams, if he's, if he's out a little bit, I don't, I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem, uh, honestly. Uh, and, and that's because you saw, you saw with Tua at quarterback, there's, there's a sort of rationality to the wide receivers unit that, that happens um, where everybody can play the role that they're really good at. 
you know mm -hmm. um they're having you know they're having preston williams now that he's gotten even with preston williams in there you could see the chemistry between he and preston williams sort of growing almost throw by throw learning each other a little bit and and that's happening I think with all of the receivers, I think that's happening with Jakeem Grant. Uh, they know they know when he's going to be open and how, um, because he is quite reliable at getting open in certain against certain looks um, and certain situations. So I think they're going to keep doing that. I think uh, when that keeps popping open, you know, watch out for the double move all of a sudden uh, to uh, to to go over top. Um, I think that Malcolm Perry, they're still, they're clearly still working and, and he's going to be, he's going to be a guy on the inside for those RPOs. Um, and so I, I keep watching, keep an eye on that. And then Matt Collins came in there and what do they do? You know, they, they, they know what he's good for on that, on that, uh, that RPO that we talked about, you know, you do a box count and it's press man coverage. So what do you do? You just throw the fade to him. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and throw it up for him and, and have him go up and get it. He's like, almost like a tight end. We, he's being used like a tight end. He killed somebody on a block. Yes. We commented during the game. They um, ran 10 personnel with Matt Collins yeah. at playing tight end. <laughs> yeah. He was, and they ran I a mean, wham block with him. And they ran, yeah. And they, they ran a wham block with him and he killed somebody. <laughs> I mean, he, he was, it was tremendous. Um, so I, this is all, it's all going to look rational. It's all going to look like, Oh, these guys are all doing what they're good at. Yes. And um, and I think that that kind of starts with the play caller and the quarterback and and how they're, you know, um, how they're looking out for one another. Yeah. And it was also very interesting in the clutch. Who did he look for? Devontae Parker. Right. So some big third down conversions. Well, there was also, uh, you know, I, I noted there was Devontae Parker in a big, big moment. But it was also, um, you know, there's uh, that. They needed they needed the yardage. They were out out of yardage for the field goal, right? Mm -hmm. And it was third and ten, and uh, third and long, third and ten. You know, it's it's really a tough down. You've really got a stacked against you. Um, they need that yardage to get a to get a, a doable field goal, and they went with you know what do they dial up? And that's that's Jakeem Grant on a underneath route you know, breaking off underneath uh, the coverage. And because you know that he's always open on that. Yeah. And, um, and sure enough, he was, and, and he got, he got the nine yards, um, gotten, they got the field goal. They got the go ahead game winner. And if they hadn't gotten that yardage, it could have been a very, very tricky situation. So and they, they rely on all kinds of different guys in these key moments. And I, I think that's uh that's cool. Can I just, uh, can I just say one thing before we get out of here about uh, the kicker? Jason mm -hmm. Sanders, um, who I think is just, you know, everybody knows how good Justin Tucker is, but this season, the best kicker in the NFL has patently been Jason Sanders of the Miami Dolphins. And I'd just like to read you a tweet, which says, Jason Sanders is Miami's new kicker. Dan Rizzi worked him out in New Mexico. He has a monster leg capable of 70-yard field goal distance. Best kickoff percentage in terms of touchbacks as a junior and a senior. Soccer player needs consistency, but huge upside. Now, that was tweeted on April the 28th, 2018, and it was very apposite for the person who tweeted that. So congratulations to me. <laughs> but in all seriousness, he has been absolutely fantastic. And that 56-yarder and then a 50-yarder. I mean, the kid hasn't missed all season. He is the all-pro kicker. Um, and uh, kudos to Jason Starless because he is having a superb season. Yeah, they made him kick a fifty-six yarder to to tie the record, to tie the franchise record for consecutive yeah. makes. I mean, yeah. they didn't make that and easy. A 50, and a fifty-yarder to beat it. Yeah. That's how much I hate <laughs> Jason Sanders. Yeah, I was oh. saying, I I had a tweet uh, as as soon as he hit that that fifty-yarder. Dolphins have had some great kickers in their history: Gary Upremi and Fouad mm. Rivas. Somebody said, hey, what about Uwe Wanchaman? Look, I, I saw Uwe Wanchaman kick for the Dolphins. He was absolutely god-awful. So, Pete no. Stojanovic, great kicker. Pete Stojanovic was great. Mm -hmm. Alindo Mari might have been the Mari. best out of that group. Dan Carpenter was really good. Jason Sanders is better than all yeah, of them. Yeah, he was. All right. That's it. And the next time we will talk to you, we will talk to you about a preview against the Chargers. That's Tua Tonga Bailoa versus Justin Herbert. Still left on the schedule is Joe Burrow. Still left on the schedule is Patrick Mahomes. Some fun games coming up. But till then. Thanks for listening to Three Yards Per Caddy. 
You can subscribe via iTunes, on Podbean or your usual podcast provider.